Hi, Julia. Do you still want to do an intro? All right. Hi, everyone. Um, it's one o'clock, so we're going to get started. Um, I think a few more people will start to tune in. But uh, thank you, everybody, for joining the first of four cyber seminars this month that feature the research of students and early career scientists in hydrology. We H3S are really excited to be partnering with Kwasi to put on this seminar series. So as you probably know, every Thursday for the month of April, at the same time, one o'clock, we'll be hearing talks from four students or early career scientists. So this week's theme is coastal dynamics in a changing world. Um, and next week we'll be hearing talks about rivers and lakes under a changing climate. And so without further ado, we'll get started. Our first presenter is Kyra Kim. She's a soon to graduate PhD student at the University of Delaware, um, presenting her work on beaches. So Kyra, it's all you. Great, thanks Julia. Um, so thanks everyone for virtually joining me. Today I'll be talking to you about the dynamic migration of chemical reactions in the beach aquifer. So let's just jump right into it. Um, slideshow does not want to, there we go. Um, so a lot of activity happens within our coastlines. We have agricultural activity, um, residential areas and coastlines are expanding in its aerial extent. Um, we have also a lot of tourism that happens on beaches. These activities generate nutrients um, that pass through the coastal aquifer as it's picked up by the fresh groundwater. These nutrients directly discharge to um, coastal ecosystems and in its uh, excess, these terrestrial nutrients are one of the key um, degradation factors for coastal environments. And so it's really important for us to understand what kind of reactions happen along the groundwater flow path for these reactions. Traditionally, we thought um, sandy beach aquifers were not very reactive because of its low organic carbon content. But recently, we've been finding out that the mixing between fresh groundwater and salty seawater during waves and tides actually promote a lot of biogeochemical reactions that are beneficial to decreasing the amount of um, terrestrial nutrients. Specifically, in my research, I look at denitrification or the consumption of nitrate into N2 gas. And so my overarching question is, what are the spatial and temporal dynamics of chemical reactions in beach aquifers? Uh, I'm going to jump ahead to the conclusions and uh, give you a little spoiler alert and show you that these reactions are spatially variable, also dynamic very seasonally um, in terms of its reactions, um, in terms of its groundwater flow path and also carbon distributions, and also very dynamic on shorter timescales. So here is a schematic diagram of a coastal aquifer. You're seeing the cross section of a beach. So here on the left, you see fresh groundwater in blue discharging seaward. And with it, it's carrying terrestrial nutrients such as nitrate and phosphate, and it's low in oxygen. Here um, in the darker orange, you're seeing the fresh or the salty seawater. It's open to the atmosphere, so it's high in or, um, oxygen. And also it has high reactive organic carbon that could serve to jumpstart some of the reactions within the beach aquifer. And that's from phytoplankton and algal detritus. So during waves and tides, it infiltrates into the aquifer. And salinity is a conservative tracer because it's not chemically reactive. And the density differences between the two make this intertidal circulation cell shown in purple here. Um, and so I'm interested in what kind of reactions happen within the circulation cell. And to study this, we have installed these multi-level pore water samplers to get a cross-sectional idea of what kind of reactions are happening. So we use traditional pore water sampling methods, such as shown here. We have these multi-level pore water sampling um, contraptions that I talked to you about. And each tube is um, located with a different depth. And so we use a pump to sample the groundwater and measure for salinity, oxygen, um, carbon in two different forms. We use particulate organic carbon and dissolved organic carbon. 
And this particulate is the particulate carbon in the pore water, not in the sediment. Uh, we also measure for nutrients. To get an idea of how fast the reactions are happening across the beach aquifer, we also measured reaction rates. Uh, mainly, we did oxygen consumption and nitrogen gas production. Um, and I'm sure everyone's familiar, but um, oxygen consumption will just basically measure how fast the carbon is degrading aerobically. And then after that, after the oxygen has been depleted, we have denitrification, which is that reaction I told you about where nitrate is being consumed to N2 and therefore beneficial for coastal environments. And so we measured um, or we obtained five replicate samples, uh, pore water samples from each sampling port. And then we incubated them over time to see how fast the oxygen was being consumed and how quickly the nitrogen gas was being produced using a mass spec shown here. So I'll show you some data. Um, and here is a salinity distribution in panel A. The warmer colors indicate salinity of the bay water. And to go back to the schematic diagram, here's that circulation cell that I was showing you. And you can see here that um, the circulation cell is very well defined in its uh, geometry and its extent. If you look at the dissolved oxygen on the bottom, um, again, the salty water is open to the atmosphere and is 100% saturated in oxygen when it enters the beach. However, with the salinity contours, you see that the salt, uh, saline water is reaching maybe negative three meters in depth, but there is a deficiency of dissolved oxygen once it reaches within the aquifer. And so it shows that there's active oxygen consumption within the beach. If you look at reaction rates, um, you're seeing that reaction rates are spatially variable. So for example, oxygen consumption is very high along that landward edge of the freshwater seawater boundary. Um, and that's because the oxic uh, seawater comes in with high oxygen availability and um, it discharges along this flow path. And so you're seeing that this relationship between groundwater flow path and also reaction rate. Nitrogen gas production, on the other hand, requires um, anoxic conditions. And so you're seeing also a similar um, pattern, but this is going to have its hotspot towards the discharge zone where oxygen availability is a little bit lower. Um, and so you can see right off the bat that these reactions are spatially variable, which was my first key point, um, and that they're controlled by these reactant delivery by groundwater flow. And that's really interesting to us because the circulation cell is dynamic on seasonal time scales. And so here's a little video that my collaborator made, and this is from a groundwater flow model. And you can see that the circulation cell is changing in its extent um, and geometry over these seasonal time scales as hydrologic conditions change. And so we want to see how reactions also adhere to that, um, or if they diverge, why. So here are some transient patterns of salinity over the seasons, and this is actual field data. Um, and it's the same kind of um, figure format that I was showing you before. It's a lot of colors, but we'll go through it. So here on the top row, I'm showing you 2014 data from July to November, and then on the 2015 data in the bottom. You're seeing that the uh, circulation cell changes in its extent um, as it goes from the more summer to fall months. And what I want you to see is that, um, that it's responding to these different hydrologic conditions and changing the groundwater flow. And so let's look at how reactions change um, with that. So here I'm showing you aerobic respiration. Um, again, the same kind of pattern should adhere where it's high along the landward edge of groundwater flow. Um, and so you're seeing here November 2014, the um, salinity uh, contours are a little bit faint, but um, you can see that the aerobic respiration is high along that landward edge here. Same thing with July and again here in September. Um, and hopefully you can see that although the magnitude is changing, the pattern of respiration is always high along that um, groundwater mixing pattern. Um, and so it indicates that these patterns of mixing and reactions are also very dynamic in time and space. One thing we haven't really talked about is organic carbon. Um, and so what we expected was that the organic carbon from seawater to come in with the, sea, um, with the salt water and adhere kind of to that groundwater flow path as well. Um, but when we looked at the particulate organic carbon, that wasn't the case. And so you're seeing here particulate organic carbon from pore water 
Um, and you can see that instead of adhering to that uh, salinity contour, it's kind of spatially variable. It's all over the place um, and it's um, very, very spatially heterogeneous. And so this indicates that these reactant reactions that maybe are not controlled by oxygen delivery, um, such as denitrification or other reactions that we're not really discussing here, um, may have these spatial patterns that diverge or are asynchronous with these um, groundwater mixing patterns. If you look at the dissolved organic carbon, which is also a more labile form of carbon, um, it's interesting to see that um, they're very spatially correlated with the particulate organic carbon. Um, here I'm not showing you absolute concentrations, I'm actually showing you um, percent dissolved organic carbon of surface water. And if you look at the pattern, it goes above 100%, which means these um, carbon patches are leached from this particulate source. Um, and so you can see that the particulate organic carbon is a um, local source of nutrients in dissolved organic carbon once it's infiltrated into the beach aquifer. And so we see that carbon's important. We already know that carbon's important for fueling reactions, but for at least oxygen consumption, these reaction rates were more controlled by oxygen availability. However, the particular carbon was variable across the beach. Um, it was acting as a local source of DOC and nutrients, and this has the potential to fuel other kind of reactions um, and have reaction patterns that are different from groundwater mixing patterns. But what we wanted to clarify was if the POC was um, part of the geologic deposit in situ, or it was actually moving and mobile with the pore water after its infiltration. What we did was these series of sand column experience, uh, experiments. We had these um, slotted columns and we filled them with clean combusted sand. So the sand was uh, combusted for about four hours um, at 450 degrees to get rid of all the organics. We hand auger them in um, across the transect um, and we let them kind of sit for two months, let it equilibrate, and we incubated the sediments and with filtered seawater to see the reactivity and kind of see the carbon content within them. So you see the mobile pore water carbon here, um, and this is the uh, sand columns that were controlled, so they weren't out in the field, and these are the columns that came back. If you zoom in, you see this gray layer, very fine gray layer from the columns that came back from the field. And when we use a microscope to look at that gray layer, we saw that it was these algal fragments and cell fragments. Um, we could therefore conclude that this POC from seawater um, is filtered into these beach sand, creating this heterogeneous distribution. And this has a lot of implications for how it's going to fuel um, reactions and how it's going to change that spatial and temporal variability of reactions across the beach aquifer. So to get a sense of how quickly these are changing or how to see that, field sampling is a little bit limited. And so we want to see this in a more short time scale. Here I'm showing you that schematic diagram again, but we used uh, redox and CTD sensors to get a sense of how these are changing in short time scale. So here you see the blue sampling ports. Um, and then we know from previous experience that this is approximately where the circulation cell was ending up in this particular um, sampling time. Uh, this is where the salinity distribution was. And then according to, depending on the hydrologic conditions, we would have the cell constrict and expand. We wanted to cover the whole salinity gradient from land to sea, and so we had redox probes installed to cover the whole salinity gradient. In areas where we expected high salinity fluctuations, we also installed CTDs to monitor the salinity. So overall, we had 32 redox sensors measuring every 15 minutes for about a month and a half. We had four CTD loggers and 10 cross-sectional field sampling of nutrients and salinity to kind of get, um, to kind of accompany the data that we were getting from these sensors. And so here's some pictures of the field installation. Um, we have these sensors, we augured them in, we ran all the cables through a trench and the data logger was recording everything. So really quickly, some spatial differences in redox signals. Here's a salinity distribution from one of the days that we did a manual uh, salinity uh, sampling. And we're gonna start from the landward side and I'm gonna show you redox sensors by depth just to show you how spatially variable they are. Um, so the top sensor is going to be in blue and the deepest sensor is going to be in purple in number four. We'd start with the landward site. You're gonna see that the uh, redox 
um, conditions are relatively stable. Um, you see the tidal signal here with the diurnal and spring leap cycles, but in this location, there's not a lot of change over time in terms of redox. However, if we go into the mixing zone, we're seeing much more dynamic activity with all of the sensors showing diurnal and spring leap signals. Um, it's much more dynamic than the more uh, landward site. If we go to the lower intertidal zone, the top two sensors in blue and orange are going to have the diurnal and the spring leap cycles, maybe with a little bit of a time lag in terms of when the signals come through. Um, but in the other two, they're relatively stable. So really quickly, I'm just showing you how dynamic these um, conditions are. And redox conditions reflect the overall chemical condition of that uh, location. And so we can see beyond field sampling where we saw seasonally, these systems are changing very quickly. And this is uh, my last data slide to really show you that effect. So here's July 13th of 2017 and July 20th. It was about a week apart and the salinity distribution didn't change that much. We interpolated the four CTD sensors as well, and within that small zone, um, there was not a lot of change. But you're going to see here the redox fluctuations with more oxidizing in yellow and reducing in blue. And this hourly data is going to show you that the redox conditions are fluctuating at very, very um, small time uh, scales than, we're, um, than we were seeing in the field data. And so hopefully I've shown you that beach aquifers are very dynamic zones of biogeochemical reactions. Um, and that these reaction characteristics are spatially and temporarily complex, influenced by, but can be decoupled from hydrologic changes due to some of the distributions and supply in carbon and other reactants. And with that, thank you for your attention. And I believe up next we have Dion. Yep, and if there's any questions, we could probably address have time to address one question and um, you can type those in the chat box as we transition to the next speaker. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Um, and, um, I'm not sure if I'm shooting my screen or not. Uh, we could just see your presentation. It's uh, okay. There Over you here. Go. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> All right. If it doesn't look like we have any questions, so we'll move on to our next speaker, who is Dion Knights. He's a PhD student at the Ohio State University, and he's going to talk to us today about Delta wetlands. It's all yours. Okay. Let me get this going. Okay, thank you. I will be talking about the capacity of freshwater delta wetlands to remove nitrate from groundwater. So, as a oh, sorry, I should set this 100. Okay, so as a quick background, we know that human beings are really good at adding a bunch of nitrate into the environment. In fact, over the past 100 years or so, we've been doing this primarily through um, fertilizer application and agricultural practices. So once nitrate is in the soil, it can infiltrate into groundwater and get discharged to the coast through direct groundwater discharge, or it can intersect rivers and be discharged that way. The um, net effect of that is we have a lot of nitrate being discharged towards the coast, and this has several environmental consequences such as the development of harmful algal blooms and eutrophic and hypoxic conditions. So I'll be looking at that in that section right at the coast where many deltas form to understand how deltas um, control nitrate processing before water gets to the coast. So we know that Wetlands are pretty good at removing some nitrate. They do this through um, a bunch of different mechanisms. Here I talked about denitrification, where nitrate is converted to nitrogen gas. It's an um, anaerobic um, process. We could have plant assimilation, where plant takes up the nitrate and um, stores it as organic N nitrogen in its biomass. Or we could have dissimilatory nitrate reduction to ammonia, or DNRA, where nitrate is converted into ammonium. Excuse so throughout me. the presentation, 
Yeah, sorry. Do you, uh, if you could put it in presenter view, that way people will be able to see it a little easier. Sorry. Okay, we're talking about the PowerPoint? Yes, there you go. Oh. Yeah, that, I was nervous that that would happen. I have two screens. Um, okay. And how it was is fine. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Not a problem. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, no, you're good. Um, here we go. How do I get back out of this? Yeah. Okay, so I'll try to zoom in a little bit more to see if that helps. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, Charlie, talk. I'll be talking about um, nitrate removal, which I'm not looking at any of these processes individually, but the cumulative effect of all of these different processes. So again, I'm looking at Waxlick Delta, which is in the Gulf of Mexico. It's just west of the um, Atchafalaya Delta. Uh, Waxlick Delta began forming about 60 years ago after a channel from the uh, Atchafalaya River was dredged. And I'll be using spatially explicit 2D reactive transport models. I'm working with Doug Edmonds and Elizabeth Oliver at Indiana University. And they've come up with a flow model of wax lake delta using a DEM. So what you're looking at here is um, one of the outputs from that flow model. I'm showing you height, water height, so you can see the different islands on the delta. We have flow coming in to the domain from here, and it discharges downwards and outwards. So what about reactions? How is, um, how is removal happening on this delta? And in order to figure that out, I need to understand what the reaction rates are doing and if and how they are variable spatially. So this brings me to ecogeomorphic zones. Um, what we're looking at here is an aerial image of Wax Lake Delta. I'm zoomed in on Mike Island. And we can see that Mike Island in particular and Wax Lake Delta in general is made up of several different ecogeomorphic zones. Um, we, which, are, which were formed by an interplay between geomorphology and ecology. So as a brief example, we have the sub-aerial levee, which is right at the head of the, um, the island. And as we go downstream and um, decreasing in elevation, we could get the sub-aqueous levee. We could also get some secondary channels right over here, which um, connects the primary channel to the inner um, island and we can get it downstream levy. So I suspect or suspected that removal rate would vary across these very different unique ecogeomorphic zones. <clears throat> and in order to capture that, I use a system of open atmospheric benthic chambers, which is a very fancy word for a 55 gallon drum, as you can see here, with the top and the bottom cut off. So I use um, a network of this of these spread across Mike Island. And when these are installed, they sit about 15 centimeters below the sediment water interface, so they're standing water in the chamber. And I take nitrate concentration, nitrate concentration measurements with time. So what you're looking at here is the nitrate concentration in milligrams per liter and the normalized nitrate concentration. In this chamber, I added um, chloride as a conservative tracer. And we see a decrease in nitrate per time in each of each, each of these chambers relative to the conservative tracer. So that is indicating some sort of removal. Um, if we take the slope of this line, we get a first order reaction rate, which, I, which I'm calling VF. So for the levy, this is one example. We have a VF of 40 millimeters per hour. And in the lagoon, here's my benthic chamber way back there. Um, in the lagoon, we have it about 10 times less. So we're already starting to see some differentiation across these different zones. So when I put all my data together, I grouped them by five different sites. We started we're seeing that the um, removal rate is highest at the um, upstream sub subaqueous levee, and it's and it's lowest in the lagoons here. 
if I plot this with my DEM, we can see that removal rate increases with elevation. So we have a positive correlation. Um, and we also see that the actual nitrate concentration on the island decreases with elevation. And that makes a lot of sense. As, as the removal rate increases at, the, at that location at the higher elevation, we would expect less nitrate to be present in the background water. So I um, characterized removal rate. So I came up with a simple relationship with uh, elevation. So back to the two-dimensional model. What I have here is, um, so this again is wax flake delta. And for my initial conditions, I um, set the removal rate to be high, so about 50 millimeters um, per day. Uh, that should be our 50 millimeters per hour to be um, high at the highest elevation and low at the lowest elevation. So just the two, two scenarios. And what my output looks like, what you're looking at here again is wax flake delta. We have, in, we have discharging water here coming in and flowing downwards and outwards at five milligrams per liter. And we could start to see already on the islands preferential removal location. So we're seeing that nitrate is preferentially removed on the delta islands here compared to the channels. We're also seeing that most of the nitrate is about um, zero milligrams per liter right at the apex here, and it increases um, downstream. So that is similar to, um, to what I saw in the field with low nitrate at the head of the island and nitrate increasing downwards. I must say that these, this the flow model and the um, reactive transport model is preliminary. There's still some work to do on them, but we can start to see some general patterns. We know that nitrate removal rate is not dependent only on elevation that the delta is very dynamic. There's a lot of different things going on. There's vegetation. We talked about plant uptake. Um, we know that nitrate removal um, changes with concentration, with water height, with seasonal effects like temperature. So other factors, so these are the other factors that are correlated with removal. So my final, my ongoing work is I'm going to set up a, well, I've set up a multiple linear regression, which is going to include all of those variables. And for each location on the delta, it is going to give me um, a removal rate. And then we can use that flow model to, to, um, to get an estimate of how much nitrate is removed from the system. So I'm going to, I'll be testing that model soon. And, um, these are my acknowledgements, and thank you. I think we'll um, take questions if we have any. Yep, there's time for questions. Um, and we, if we don't have any, we can... Um, begin to pass off as maybe people types them in to our next presenter, which is Jackie Liu. Hello. All right, we can, um, it doesn't look like there's any questions, so uh, can pass off to the next speaker. Um, so, Jackie Liu is a, also a PhD student at the University of Tokyo, uh, and he's going to be talking to us today about uh, tsunami-induced seawater intrusion. So you've got it in full screen. It's all yours. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to this presentation. Um, good morning from Tokyo. <laughs> Okay, so uh, my talk will be uh, focused on tsunami uh, in coastal area and as well as the groundwater system. So we focused on one small island called Nijima in Japan. Uh, so this is the outline uh, of my talk today. So we'll start with tsunami disaster and saltwater intrusion. 
what will be the future tsunami risks at the study area together with the hydrogeological settings of the island. Uh, the overall objective of this study is to predict the groundwater salinization issues and their future tsunami scenarios. And we hope to provide suggestions for how to deal with the groundwater salinization issues uh, for the island after the tsunami. So we will be using numerical groundwater modeling methods. And for the results part, I will discuss about uh, what, e what would be the situation during tsunami inundation and what would be the situation after tsunami inundation and how we can supply fresh water to the local people after the disaster. Okay, so let's start. So these two um, vertical cross sections uh, conceptually showing the coastal groundwater system. Uh, we have, um, sorry, uh, we have uh, seawater, freshwater interactions. Uh, we have unsaturated zone, we have fresh groundwater system. And beneath that we have bedrock. And the figure below is showing uh, the situation when uh, tsunami happens. The tsunami will inundate uh, the coastal area, which cause large scale seawater flooding events. And the seawater will infiltrate into soil and uh, salinize groundwater system uh, in the vertical direction. So these are the measured groundwater salinity after the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami and after 2011 Tohoku, uh, Tohoku tsunami disasters. So we can see that uh, right after the tsunami events, the groundwater salinity was uh, significantly increased, which is not appropriate uh, being used for domestic uh, water supply. So here is the uh, map of the uh, study area. Uh, the study area is called Nijima Island, which is not very far from Tokyo. Uh, it is located in a tsunami uh, prone zone. So the government of Japan is anticipated uh, that there will be a large scale uh, earthquake occur along the so-called Nankai Trough. And under this scenario, the Nijima Island will be uh, inundated by uh, seawater up to 15 meters above mean sea level. So on the uh, right hand side, you can see the topography map of this island. Uh, it is composed of several uh, volcanoes in the north and in, in the southern part. And in the middle, there is a low lying plain, and which will be suffering from the tsunami inundation. So uh, this is the uh, geological uh, information of this island. So this is uh, this island has a single layered unconfined aquifer which, which was formed by pyroclastic deposits in 886 AD. Uh, and I would like to highlight that uh, the hydraulic conductivity is uh, relative high. Uh, the average rainfall on this island is around 2000 millimeter per year and about uh, 30 to 50% of the annual, uh, annual rainfall recharge the groundwater system. There's no rivers and there's no lakes on this island. So groundwater is the only freshwater supply source for the local people. So once tsunami hit this island, um, the, um, uh, the freshwater supply will be suffer from the tsunami inundation. So the overall objective is to predict salt water intrusion and groundwater recovery processes under these future tsunami scenarios at the Nijima Island. And we hope to provide suggestions how we can provide post-disaster water supply to the local people. So here we use uh, numerical groundwater modeling methods to solve variable density flow in unsaturated, saturated porous media uh, we use both three-dimensional modeling and two-dimensional modeling. Uh, these are showing uh, the boundary condition settings. So we um, split the simulation into four stages. So the first stage will be simulating the normal condition uh, of the groundwater system before the tsunami arrival. And during the two hours of tsunami inundation and after the tsunami inundation. 
So here I would like to highlight the hydraulic conductivity is really relative high, uh, 1.1 uh, 10 to powers min minus three meter per second, and uh, re uh, rainfall recharge rate was about 800 millimeter per year. Uh, so this figure is showing the uh, cross section uh, in the middle of the island, which is the along the line MH, and the right color is showing uh, high salinity where the blue color showing the fresh uh, groundwater salinity. And this is showing the results during uh, and two hours tsunami inundation. And as you can see that uh, uh, in about 10 minutes, the salt water can reach to groundwater table. And about 40 minutes, the unsaturated zone beneath the tsunami inundation area has been fully saturated by the salt water. Uh, in the, uh, if you look at the, uh, I'm sorry, I cannot show the the mouse. Maybe it's it's better. Uh, okay, sorry about that. So if you look at this figure, this is showing the the increase of the total mass that uh, enter the groundwater system through the inundated surface. So we can see that uh, the increase was significantly slowed down around 30 minutes, which was corresponding to the time when the unsaturated zone was fully saturated by the intruded salt water. So here the implication is the unsaturated zone provides the room storing salt water during the tsunami inundation. So if we have a uh, unsaturated zone with a thicker vertical um, distance, then that might be more vulnerable vulnerable for the island uh, to the tsunami because if we have a thicker and saturated zone, there will be more salt water stored in the uh, in the island. And these two figures are showing the situation, the simulation after the tsunami inundation. The upper figure is showing the tsunami inundation after 50 meters and the lower figure is showing the situation after 25 meters high tsunami inundation. And as you can see, they show very different pattern of the salt water movement. In the upper figure, the salt water infiltrate downwards into the deeper part of the groundwater system and gradually uh, flushed out by the natural rainfall uh, from the, through the, the coastline in the west. Uh, in the west. Uh, however, the situation in the tsunami inundation after 25 meters become very different. As you can see that the salt water cross the central topography high of the bedrock and move towards the east. So this is saying, even though this part of the groundwater system was not directly inundated by the tsunami, but it was still got, uh, got salinized due to the movement of the salt water. So the implication here is the bedrock uh, is, has uh, important effect on salt water movement uh, because the salt water has a higher density than fresh water. So it tends to move to the bottom and move along uh, the decreasing slope of the bedrock surface. Uh, so currently, uh, in this scenario, we have bedrock surface with the convex upward uh, shape. However, if we have a bedrock surface in a convex downward shape, uh, we can uh, imagine that the salt water probably will stay in the local de uh, depression for a longer time. So those figures are showing the three-dimensional numerical modeling results. Uh, for the upper part, uh, upper figure is showing uh, the salt water intrusion influence several uh, groundwater valves, showing by the black dots after 25 meters tsunami inundation. So the recovery process took more than about 10 years. So we wonder uh, how we can supply 
the fresh water to the local people instead of the, the bottled water or transport the water from Tokyo. Then we conduct uh, the simulation that we pump fresh water from these three wells, uh, which were not inundated, which were not affected during the uh, salt water intrusion processes. Uh, so here we found that basically there's no difference between the pumping scenario and no pumping scenario. And it should be noted that the total pumping rate from this river was equivalent to the pre-tsunami water supply amount. So this is saying that there is a high potential that we can use those uninfluenced groundwater system to supply fresh water to the local people if tsunami happened to this island. So here comes to the uh, summary. Uh, we simulate the seawater fresh uh, seawater intrusion and their uh, tsunami inundation scenario in Nijima Island of Japan. And we found that during tsunami inundation, the unsaturated zone control and determine the amount of the salt water infiltrate into the subsurface. And after the tsunami inundation, the bedrock surface can influence the salt water movement direction. And we found that pumping the unpolluted part of groundwater has the uh, potential to provide post-disaster uh, water supply. So I guess that's, that is the most uh, of the contents I would like to share today. So if you have any questions. Well, thank you. That was a fantastic presentation. Does anybody have any questions? We can transition. There's plenty of time if there's questions out there. Um, if not, I can. All right, well, I don't see any questions. And in that case, uh, I'm actually the last speaker today. Uh, I should probably introduce myself. I'm Julia Guimond. I'm a PhD student at the University of Delaware and also a member of H3S, which is the Hydrology Section Student Subcommittee. And so in partnership with Quasi, we're holding these cyber seminars. Uh, but we also do a lot of other things. And so we're a group of uh, 12 elected students. And our main goal is to uh, host professional development opportunities for students and early career scientists. And so we have cyber seminars such as this one, um, hopefully more to come. Uh, we also at the AGU fall meeting, hold sessions, town halls, workshops, pop-up talks, and networking events. Um, and this summer, we're starting a new social media campaign. Uh, so it's a social media takeover. So any hashtags that are hashtag Hydro Summer, we will retweet. Or if you're interested in taking over our account for a day um, or during a field campaign, to share your summer research with the community, please contact us. Uh, we really want to get uh, the research of students and early career scientists out there. And of course, if you have any ideas on what we can do or better serve um, our community, feel free to email us, email us those ideas as well. So with that, I will start um, hopefully we can move forward with this presentation. All right, we'll have to do this way. Okay, so today I'm going to present my work titled Sea Level Rise Impacts on Groundwater Surface Water Exchange and Hydro Redox Donations in a Temperate Salt Marsh Implications for Carbon Cycling. Um, here we go. 
So I want to start with a quote from one of my favorite books, and I don't have time to read the whole thing, but we'll just focus on the last line that says that the coast and all the living beings on it are changing radically. Coastlines are changing radically, they're also changing rapidly, which, which puts an added pressure on coastal scientists. Not only do we need to understand ecosystems and how they function in the present day, but we need to strive to understand how these ecosystems will change in the face of global climate change. Uh, because that understanding not only impacts the sustainability of the ecosystem itself, but the ecosystems surrounding it. So the motivation for my work is to not only understand um, coastal wetland dynamics um, and how they function today and how the carbon dynamics function today, but also to take a look into the future and understand how they respond to sea level rise. So to take a step back, uh, salt marshes are incredibly important ecosystem. They provide numerous ecosystem services, such as protecting coastline from storm surges. Uh, they filter nutrients and contaminants before reaching the coastal ocean. Uh, they provide housing and shelter for juvenile fish that eventually feed the offshore fishing industry. But what's not depicted here is that they also sequester large amounts of carbon. And so uh, to put this in uh, perspective, they sequester more per hectare than terrestrial ecosystems. And so they're an important carbon sink on the global scale. But as you can imagine, there's large uncertainties in the carbon budgets. And so thanks to the development of the eddy-covariance method, uh, there's been a huge increase in our understanding of the vertical dynamics, so the exchange of carbon vertically between the marsh and the atmosphere, but there's still large uncertainties in the lateral flux of dissolved carbon between tidal wetlands, estuaries, and shelf waters, as well as large uncertainties in how these carbon budgets are going to change with global climate change. And so in this project, we address how sea level rise changes proportions and spatial patterns of salt marsh zonations, which uh, largely impact the carbon dynamics, and I'll explain on the next slide, and how does sea level rise impact the groundwater surface water exchange and carbon delivery to the coastal ocean. So uh, in our previous work, we looked at some of the linkages between different ecosystem components. Um, salt marshes are typically uh, divided into zonation based on the vegetation or on the inundation frequency, which gives us that low, medium, high marsh zones. But we took this one step further and developed what we call hydro redox zonations, which give us a better idea of what's happening in the subsurface. And so these are plots of the water table elevation with time in each of the zones. The dotted gray line is the ground surface. And what you'll notice is that uh, they're drastically different patterns in each of the zones. And so in this diurnally inundated zone, you see large tidal fluctuations that go above and below the marsh platform. In this periodically inundated zone, uh, you see longer time scale changes. So you see this lunar 14 day tidal cycle our um, lunar cycle, and in this constantly inundated zone, you see uh, tidal oscillations, but the groundwater table um, is either above or very close uh, to the ground surface through the entire time period shown here. And so these water table elevation oscillations impact the subsurface redox potential. And so we measure the redox with multi-depth redox sensors so, so we can get a, an idea of the redox potential with depth. And as you'll notice, these patterns in the hydrology um, are mirrored in the redox potential. So in this diurnal inundated zone, you see large redox oscillations that go from really oxidizing conditions to really reducing conditions. 
um, and pe penetrate uh, deep into the subsurface. In this periodically inundated zone, you have oxidizing conditions at the surface um, and fairly reducing conditions at depth, but you don't see these large temporal changes. And in this constantly inundated zone, there's uh, some variability at the surface, but when we look at depth, um, the redox potential is all very similar. And so this is the basis of our hydro redox zones. And each of these zones impacts what's happening with the carbon dynamics. And so if we think of this in terms of the carbon in this tidal near creek zone, uh, this really dynamic zone, you have um, frequent flushing of the near creek pore water and uh, these large oscillations between oxidizing and reducing conditions, which leads to less carbon storage. If we look at the spring neap zone, we have oxidizing conditions at the surface, reducing at depth and uh, less tidal flushing. And so you get this moderate carbon storage zone. And if we look into this tidal interior, there's little, very little pore water exchange, um, and you have consistently anoxic conditions. So there's not a lot of carbon oxidation, resulting in this greater start carbon storage potential. And so based on these linkages between the hydrology and the redox potential and carbon dynamics, really the physics and the chemistry, we can use a hydrological model to understand or get an idea of how these carbon dynamics will change um, given changes in the hydrology or due to sea level rise. And so that's what we did. We developed a hydrological model of our field site uh, using hydrogeosphere, just to give you an idea of where uh, the marsh is located. It's in about halfway down the state of Delaware. Um, at the St. Jones National Estuarine Research Reserve. So uh, this is the surface of our model domain. It's a coupled surface, subsurface, um, variably saturated, and coupled saturated, unsaturated model. Um, we have a tidal boundary condition, which is the St. Jones River at the bottom here. And the upland boundary condition is uh, based on monitoring well data. And so this model has been calibrated to field data that we've been collecting for the past few years, um, giving confidence in um, the model results. And so for to think about the future, we ran nine different simulations. So we have three sea level rise scenarios, uh, half a meter, a meter and a meter and a half. But in these marshes, you also have to consider sediment accretion. And so we used three different scenarios of sediment accretion to give us nine uh, different simulations. But you also have to think about um, the upland boundary. And so as sea level rises, you're gonna also get an increase in head on land. And so for each of these nine simulations, we ran them three times. So we have um, one simulation, we run the same upland boundary condition for all sea level rise scenarios. Uh, the second, we increased the head 54% of sea level rise, which is rooted in the literature. And the last set of simulations, we increased the upland boundary head equivalent to that of sea level rise. So I'll just show you what the model looks like. Um, these are the tidal oscillations. This is a neap time period, and you can see we start to transition to more of a spring, and you get flooding of the marsh platform. And so with this hydrological model, we can begin to get a uh, some of the questions I mentioned earlier. So first, uh, determine the areas of each of the hydro redox zones. 
as well as quantifying the amount of groundwater surface water exchange. And in the interest of time, unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about this groundwater surface water exchange. We're just going to focus on some of the preliminary results of the hydro redox zone analysis. And so just to remind you, based on the harmonic frequency and uh, the percent of time inundated for each of the nodes in our model, we're able to um, assign it a specific zone. And so we can do this for every simulation we run. And so this is some of the preliminary data. What I'm showing here on the y-axis is the percent of area of each of the zones. So the creek, the tidal near creek, the spring neap, tidal interior and upland zone. Um, and you're reminded of their carbon storage potential at the bottom of the screen. And on the x-axis, each of these is one simulation um, with different uh, sea level rise scenarios. And so the first thing you'll notice is that around 0.42 meters, you see a huge increase in um, the creek area, which is really the subtidal zone, which has very uh, low carbon storage potential. But you also see a decrease in this tidal interior zone as we go from present day conditions into some of these higher sea level rise scenarios. Now, if we think, um, if we compare results between not changing the upland with actually the results, if we have the upland head increase that of sea level rise, you can see it really impacts the, um, the results. So you still see that jump in the subtitle area around 0.42 meters, but you don't see that drastic decline in the tidal interior area. You see, still have it persisting um, with sea level rise, likely because of this migration into upland areas and a higher groundwater table enables these conditions. And so just a few uh, quick preliminary conclusions. The upland head is really important for estimating future zonation patterns. We have this threshold in which we see the conversion to um, large subtitle areas, and this threshold is about one meter. Um, and uh, with that, I'll take questions. And if you have any uh, comments or thoughts, my email is also at the bottom of the page. And that also concludes um, the cyber seminar. So if anybody has any questions for anyone, um, with that, we, we can end the seminar. Thank you for joining. And uh, yeah, tune in next week for four new talks on rivers and lakes. Oh, maybe we have a question.